Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello viewers, welcome to this next lecture on the NPTEL MOOC course on Mathematical Portfolio Theory. You would recall that in the last class we started off on a new topic, uh, namely looking at risk measures beyond the Markovitz setup of uh, uh, variance or equivalently standard deviation. And we identified two important risk measures, namely value at risk and conditional value at risk. And in the previous class, as a prelude to the discussion on value at risk and conditional value at risk, we introduced the concept of uh, uh, what is quantiles in terms of the cumulative distribution function and we looked at some of the examples. So, in today's class, we will be focused on uh, starting our topic uh, discussion on the topic of value at risk or VAR and then we will look at some of the properties of VAR and we will conclude with uh, uh, looking at what is going to be the VAR in case of a, uh, in case of a risky asset namely a stock which follows the geometric Brownian motion. Uh, so, accordingly we start this lecture. And uh, uh, this will be basically a part of the uh, broader uh, discussion on measuring downside risk. And you have already seen some of the downside risks uh, when you are talking about the non-mean variance framework. And uh, for the sake of brevity, we work on a single step financial market model in which we invest at time t is equal to 0 and terminate our investment at time t is equal to capital T. Uh, so, that means that the investment horizon is going to be some time t equal to 0 uh, when the investment is initiated and at time t equal to capital T when the investment is terminated. So, we denote by x the discounted value of the position at time capital T. So, basically if you look at the value of uh, your position at time t and you take the discounting uh, of that, that particular random variable that is the discounted uh, value of the random variable at time t given by the value of the asset that will be used, denoted by the new random variable x and for subsequent discussion we will essentially when you talk about a random variable x we will mainly be focused on this particular random variable. All right. So, let us start off with the definition of value at risk. So, uh, for some alpha which lies strictly between 0 and 1, we define the value at risk which is abbreviated as VAR as I mentioned yesterday with the R in capital of x at confidence level 1 minus alpha as follows. So, this var of x at confidence level alpha 
is indicated by a superscript of alpha. So, actually the confidence level is 1 minus alpha and I indicate this with a superscript of alpha. This is defined as nothing but minus the upper quantile of x and this is minus and what was the definition of upper quantile? This was infimum of x such that alpha less than f x of x. So, uh, how does this look graphically? Uh, so, we take the random variable x on the x axis and on the y axis we of course have f x of x. Then the cumulative uh, distribution is something uh, that obviously is going to look like this and uh, eventually uh, of course, it as your uh, as you as your x increases, this value approaches one. Now, what we do is uh, that we fix some value of alpha out here, uh, which obviously lies strictly between zero and one, and we look at uh, this horizontal line corresponding to alpha. And then we identify the corresponding uh, value on the x axis. So, now you observe that see the, this line is the line for alpha. So, the region that is satisfies the condition that alpha is strictly less than f x of x, that region is going to be nothing but since your alpha is less than. So, it is basically this region that you have here, this region will be alpha uh, is greater than f x of x because alpha lies above the curve here and this region is the region where you have alpha is strictly less than f x of x. So, accordingly when I am going to calculate var that is equivalently I have to calculate the inf minus infimum of all those x's for which alpha less than f x of x. So, I consider this region where alpha less than f x of x and consider all the x's which are basically this part. So, it is essentially all the x's from uh, this part onwards and I look at the smallest value of x right and the smallest value of x and in this region of alpha being strictly less than f x of x that smallest value of x will be given by this. And what is this? This by definition is q alpha of x and from here you see that q alpha of x is nothing but minus var of x. So, essentially the, what you need to do is that you look at that cumulative distribution of x and then we identify what is this x uh, for uh, which, uh, what is q alpha of x and that is the same as minus var alpha of x. Okay, so, now let us observe, now let us observe this very carefully that uh, since what was x? You recall that your x was nothing but the discounted value of the position at time t. So, obviously, x denotes the gain from an investment, right. So, x will be something like e raise to minus r t s t minus s 0. So, you look at your original investment s 0 and e raise to minus r t s t is the present value of your final uh, the wealth level. So, the difference between them is obviously going to be uh, the gain. So, accordingly x is here, uh, it, it is it should be interpreted as the gain from a particular investment and since uh, x is the gain, so therefore, minus x denotes the loss. So, once uh, with this observation that minus x denotes the loss, we can now express var in terms of loss as follows. And what is this going to be? So, just what is the definition of var? Var alpha of x is equal to minus q alpha of x 
and this you would recall from the result done in case of quantile this is going to be nothing but q of 1 minus alpha of minus x. So, you can recall that uh, we had already done this result. So, it is one of the results that uh, we had done in yesterday's class uh, or rather the previous class and this is uh, and what is this by definition. So, var alpha of x equal to minus of upper quantile of x by definition of var and this from the result we say that this is q of 1 minus alpha of minus x and this is now the lower quantile. So, this by definition is the smallest value of x such that this 1 minus alpha is less than or equal to the cumulative distribution function or probability of the random variable minus x being less than or equal to little x. So, this is an alternative form of writing what is going to be my var x of alpha in terms of the loss variable. And this can be written as it is the smallest value of x such that probability of x less than minus x is less than or equal to alpha. Right? Uh, so, how do I obtain this? So, basically I have 1 minus alpha is less than or equal to probability of minus x less than or equal to x. This implies that probability of minus x uh, so, this will imply that 1 minus probability of minus x being less than or equal to x is less than or equal to alpha and remember that 1 minus probability of minus x less than or equal to x is nothing but probability that minus uh, x being greater than x is less than or equal to alpha and this implies that this is probability of x being strictly less than minus x less than or equal to alpha. All right. uh, so, basically I have taken this expression and got the equivalent expression here which I have substituted out here. Okay, now, let us look at this new form of var uh, in, in this as a part of this expression and see what it means. Uh, so, we can, we can state that this means that the probability of the loss exceeding var of x is no greater than alpha or in other words at the confidence level one minus alpha our loss is no worse than var alpha of x. So, var alpha of x is the number uh, which says that at a confidence level of one minus alpha. So, for example, if your uh, alpha is uh, 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 0 0.05, so 1 minus alpha is 0 0.95. So, suppose that we have alpha is equal to uh, 0 0.05, uh, then 1 minus alpha is equal to 0 0.95 or 95 percent. So, in that case, we say that uh, in 95 percent cases, the loss is no more than var of 0 0.05 of x. Okay, uh, now, uh, let us just uh, briefly uh, enumerate some properties of var. So, let us start off with uh, x and y be uh, two random variables. So, the following properties hold. First of all, x is greater than or equal to y implies that var alpha of x is less than or equal to var alpha of y. Secondly, for any 
a belonging to R that is any real number a var alpha of x plus a is equal to a var uh, alpha of x minus a. And the third point is that for any non-negative a var alpha of a x is going to be nothing but a var alpha of x. And you see that these are corresponding to the first three properties that we had proved in the previous class and of course, the fourth property already we have made use of uh, here. So, let us just give a quick proof for each of those. Uh, so, the proof goes as follows. So, uh, if your x greater than or equal to y, so for the first one, uh, what do we have? We have x greater than or equal to y. So, then var alpha of x is going to be by definition minus of upper quantile of x. Now, when your x is greater than or equal to y, this, uh, this relation uh, results in minus q alpha of x into q alpha of y and minus q uh, uh, alpha of y that is the minus of upper quantile of y by definition is var alpha of y. For the second result, what we do is again we just make use of the definition. So, what is var alpha of uh, x? Var alpha of x, uh, so var alpha of x plus a by definition is minus q uh, uh, alpha of x plus a, that is the upper quantile of x plus a and the up q alpha of x plus a, we have already seen that this is upper quantile or q alpha of x plus a and this can be written as minus q alpha of x minus a and minus uh, upper quantile or my minus q alpha of x, this by definition is var of x minus a. So, we have proved these two results. And for the last result, we have var alpha of a x, remember a is greater than or equal to 0. This is what is going to be, this is going to be minus of q alpha of a x by definition, that is minus of upper quantile of a x. And this can be written as uh, upper quantile of a x by the result for quantiles, this is a into q alpha of x. And this can be written as a into minus q alpha of x and this is by definition is that a var alpha of x. Okay, uh, so, so far what we have done is uh, we looked at what is the definition of var in terms of the upper quantile and then uh, we were able to translate this to uh, an equivalent definition of var and an interpretation of this is that, that uh, var at a certain level alpha uh, indicates that we can say that with 1 minus alpha percentage or 1 minus alpha likelihood that uh, the var will uh, that the losses uh, will not be exceeded will not exceed this amount of var. So, when I say that uh, my alpha is equal to maybe uh, 10 percent uh, and uh, the corresponding var is some v then what you are really saying is that uh, there are 90 percent chances are that the losses are not going to exceed this amount of v and 10 percent chances are that the losses are going to exceed this amount of v. So, what it does is that at a certain level of uh, confidence, uh, it essentially gives a threshold uh, which indicates that the likelihood uh, that uh, at this particular uh, likelihood level gives the chances uh, of uh, at that uh, chances of the losses exceeding that value uh, at that particular value of alpha. So, what it essentially does is that it looks at the distribution of the returns and essentially bifurcates that into two part uh, with the with the cutoff being at var and, uh, and then uh, you essentially identify uh, that the chances of losses being above or below that particular level and that is linked with uh, what is going to be the corresponding confidence level. So, the cutoff will essentially depend on what is the confidence level. So, if you choose a different value of alpha, then obviously you are going to get a different value of var. So, every definition of var uh, obviously or any result on var must be accompanied uh, by the caveat that you have to specify what is going to be your level of alpha. So, the next thing we do is uh, we look at the example for computing var and we look at a few of those examples to illustrate uh, how the computation is done. Uh, so, for this purpose, what we shall do is that we shall assume that at 
time t is equal to 0, we invest an amount of v0 to receive an amount of v of capital T at time t is equal to capital T. Right? Uh, so, this means that you have these two timelines 0 to capital T and you invest v0 and you end up receiving an amount of v of capital T. Uh, further, we use the random variable x to denote the discounted gain at time t is equal to capital T. So, that is x is going to be e raised to minus r into t into v of t minus v 0, where r is the risk free rate with continuous compounding. All right. So, let us start off with the first example and this is going to be the uh, simplest possible ex example and uh, we assume that we invest an amount V0 at risk free rate r. So, in this case what is v of t going to be? It is going to be the investment of v0 growing by a factor of uh, e raised to r into capital T. So, therefore, what is x going to be? x is going to be e raised to minus r t uh, v of t minus v0. Uh, so, actually uh, this is just the definition of uh, x that we have uh, given earlier and what is this distribution going to be? See observe carefully that this x essentially is going to be equal to 0. All right. So, this means that x is basically going to just take one value and that is 0. So, what is going to be the corresponding distribution function? So, here uh, when your x is less than 0, then obviously the probability of that happening is going to be equal to 0 and your x being greater than or equal to 0 is going to be 1 because you know for certainty that x will take the value of 0. So, this is going to be your cumulative distribution function f x of x. Okay, now, that you have the cumulative distribution function, uh, obviously then you can calculate your quantile. So, for any alpha belonging to 0, 1, what is going to be your quantile, upper quantile? Your q alpha of x is going to be equal to 0. Right? So, because you need to consider the situation where your uh, alpha is less than f x of x and that the smallest value for that is going to be 0. So, your upper quantile is 0. So, from the distribution function you have got the upper quantile and immediately the value at risk turns out to be equal to minus the upper quantile of x uh, and that is going to be equal to 0. And now, you see that uh, in, uh, you can you observe that intuitively uh, this is what you are going to expect because uh, it is like an investment in a bond that you invest an amount of v0 and uh, then the discounted gain is simply going to be equal to 0 uh, that is e raised to minus t into v of capital T minus v0 is going to be equal to 0. And uh, the reason why the value at risk is going to be 0 is that because it is a bond and of course, assuming that you are holding on to the bond up to time capital T uh, and that is the same as the maturity of the bond, obviously you are not going to lose any amount of money. And when you are not going to lose any amount of money, that means that you are not going to suffer any losses. And so, that means that the value at risk, that is that is the amount of money that you are likely to lose naturally is going to be equal to 0. So, this is the simplest case of uh, estimating what is the value at risk. 
Now, let us move on to uh, another example as uh, this time of course, you know we will have to uh, take into consideration of what is a risky asset. So, uh, we start off with uh, uh, the second example and in this case suppose that uh, we have an x. So, that means uh, your x is uh, say it can take two values. So, suppose that x equal to minus 20 uh, that means uh, your return is uh, discounted gain is going to be minus 20 with probability. 0 0.025 it is going to be minus 10 with probability 0 0.025 and probability that x is greater than 0 is going to be 0 0.95. So, either x takes the value minus 20 or minus 10 or simply positive values with the a respective probability is being 0 0.025 each for the first two cases and 0 0.95 for uh, all the positive case. Okay, then what is going to be my f x of x? So, you see uh, if your x is less than minus 20, strictly less than minus 20, then the probability is going to be 0. So, f x of x is going to be 0. When your x is uh, lies in the close interval minus 20, that means this value all the way to minus 10, uh, but excluding 10, then the corresponding probability will be 0 0.25 and the cumulative probability is also going to be 0 0.025. Likewise, when x is from minus 10 to uh, 0, right, then you will essentially get again. So, now I have to include this probability of 0 0.025. So, the cumulative probability will be 0 0.05 and when x belongs to a 0 to infinity uh, we will get. So, this I will make it as greater than or equal to 0. So, this turns out to be equal to 1 uh, because I have to add this probability of 0 0.95. So, this is going to be the cumulative distribution uh, for this random variable x. Now, uh, we consider three values of alpha. So, suppose we consider alpha equal to 0 0.05, 0 0.025 and 0 0.005. Then what is going to be the corresponding var alpha of x? So, in the first case var alpha of x is going to be minus q raised to 0 0.05 into x and from here we see that this value is going to be equal to 0. In the second case is going to be minus q of 0 0.025 of x and so from this two we get that this is going to be minus of minus 10 which is 10 and finally, we get the last var to be minus q of 0 0.005 of x and this is in this particular range. So, this is going to be minus of minus 20 and this is going to be equal to 20. So, why did I do this example? The purpose of this example is that this example shows something that we ha I have already mentioned that uh, the var alpha of x is sensitive to the value of alpha. So, for different values of alpha you are actually getting different values of var for the same distribution here. Let us now consider a third example. So, we consider two independent investments with discounted gains being denoted by by x1 and x2 and here I specify that in both the cases uh, x i uh, is equal to 0 with probability of p that means, the discounted gain is 0 with probability p and the discounted gain is 1 with 
probability of 1 minus p. So, this is just a hypothetical example uh, and of course, you know this holds true for i equal to 1 and uh, so, this example uh, to relate it to the real life, so we can think of this as corporate bonds with identical price and maturity of two independent companies that each have a probability of default with zero recovery being equal to p. So, th what it, these are basically uh, some corporate bonds and this can, uh, so this have a maturity value of say 1, but since this is a corporate bond, so since this is a corporate bond, so it is risky. So, if the, if the, so one, only one of the two things can happen, either the company is able to pay back its promised amount of 1 or it defaults and there is no chance of recovery in which case you receive an amount of 0. So, accordingly this means that uh, and when you receive an amount of 0 that is the state of default and when you receive an amount of 1 or that is the discounted gain 1 this is a case of no default. And we assume that since the probability of default is p, so that is one reason why we say that x i takes the value of 0 with probability p and likewise for no default the probability is going to be 1 minus p. So, now suppose that your p is strictly less than alpha. So, you would have chosen some alpha and your p is strictly less than alpha. Then it follows that var of x 1 is the same as var of x 2 which is equal to minus 1. Okay. So, this means that uh, if your p is less than alpha then uh, your value at risk for x 1 uh, or value of risk set of x 2 these are individually both of them are equal to minus 1. So, that means an exclusive investment in the first uh, bond or an exclusive investment in the second bond results in the value at risk being equal to minus 1 if p is less than alpha. All right. So, we consider an alternative strategy and say that if instead we buy half unit each of the two bonds, then our gain will be the random variable half of x 1 plus half of x 2. Now, what are the values that this random variable can take? So, what can happen is that you could have, uh, so if I take x 1 and x 2, if, so either x 1 defaults and x 2 defaults, that is one possibility. If uh, or x 1 may de uh, default, but x 2 does not default or you can have that x 1 does not default and x 2 defaults and you can have that neither of them default. So, when both of them default, the probability is going and you remember that I had said that these are two independent companies. So, this means that the probability of both the defaults, this probability is going to be simply p square. The probability of a single default, uh, say in this case as well as in this case and one no default, these probabilities are going to be p into 1 minus p uh, and p into 1 minus p. And the probability of no default in both the cases, this is going to be 1 minus p whole square. So, this means that this random variable half x 1 plus half x 2 either can take the value half of the sum of these two which is 0 or it can take the value of half of 0 plus 1 or 1 plus 0. So, that is simply half or it takes half of 1 plus half of 1 which is equal to 1. So, for this value of 0, the probability is p square. Now, for these two cases, we have 
the combined probability to be equal to uh, twice p into 1 minus p and the third case uh, we have probability 1 minus p square. So, if we choose alpha to be in the interval say p plus p square plus twice p into 1 minus p. Suppose we choose this alpha. Uh, so, this means that obviously, uh, this means that uh, alpha is uh, greater than p. right? So, it is consistent with this condition. So, if I choose an alpha in this case from this interval that will satisfy this condition and then I choose uh, uh, the same alpha in the second case. So, then what happens? Then the f x f of half x 1 plus half x 2 that means the distribution function of this random variable the cumulative distribution of that uh, at uh, when it takes the value half. So, this is going to be what the cumulative distribution of this up to half is simply going to be this probability plus this probability which is p square plus twice p into 1 minus p which is greater than alpha. So, this means that my f x of x is greater than alpha and hence what is going to be the smallest value uh, for which this is greater than alpha. So, hence var of half x 1 plus half x 2 is going to be equal to is going to be equal to half. So, you observe that hence the value at risk of half x 1 plus half x 2 is going to be greater than either of this. So, I can write that in the form of maximum of var of x 1 and var of x 2. Okay, so, let us come to the main uh, point in actually uh, bringing this example into the picture and uh, this means that the risk of a diversified portfolio or a diversified uh, position as measured by var. So, this is the uh, var of the diversified portfolio because you have invested in both the bonds is greater than the risk as measured by var. for an investment in a single bond. Uh, so, the ram immediate ramification for this is the following that this runs counter to the principle that diversification would reduce risk and therefore, illustrates a drawback in using var to measure risk. So, uh, let me elucidate this in a little more detail. Uh, see, when you started looking at var, var uh, gave a very uh, nice uh, improvement over using standard deviation because uh, as a measure of risk because it looked at uh, some sort of a worst case scenario uh, in 95 percent of the time or rather uh, or equivalently say in the 5 percent of the time. So, when I say that 
uh, we are looking at 95 percent VAR. So, it basically means that uh, we are 5 percent certain that the losses will not exceed, uh, we are, we are, will exceed a certain amount uh, that is the VAR and 95 percent chances are that you are safe and the losses will not exceed that amount. So, this might also, so this is certainly an improvement over using just the standard deviation as a uh, measure of risk. Uh, however, uh, we must also keep in mind that uh, at the heart of portfolio theory uh, in the paradigm of the Markowitz framework, the key aspect uh, towards achieving uh, a portfolio optimization is diversification. And uh, through this example uh, in which we consider two individual bonds and then a combination of those two bonds which are identical. So, that means that your initial investment uh, is identical in case of the individual bond or a half and half investment in those bonds. And it turns out that in this case the value at risk uh, that you have for alpha being greater than p, it turns out that as a result of diversification the value at risk actually has increased as compared to a situation where you would have just invested in either of the individual bonds. So, this essentially uh, is a sing single counter example and there are many such counter examples that you can create which says that the value at risk while being you know a good alternative to uh, using standard deviation or variance as a risk measure suffers from these drawbacks that not in all situations can you achieve uh, an improvement in terms of risk reduction just because you have uh, carried out diversification and it is this key weaknesses in case of value at risk that motivates the usage of uh, the introduction and usage of the conditional value at risk that we are going to introduce in the next class. So, let us continue our discussion uh, keeping in mind this uh, uh, shortcoming but nevertheless keeping in mind the, the usefulness of VAR as compared to just the standard deviation. Let us now continue our discussion and uh, elaborate a little more on this by looking at a couple of important results, uh, one in the discrete case and one in the continuous time case. So, we first present this result 1, it says the following that assume that x is a discrete random variable with probability x equal to x psi say is equal to pi. Uh, so, suppose that I have this uh, discrete random variable x which takes the values capital N number of values which I denote by little x 1 through little x n and I denote the corresponding probability with as little p 1 through uh, pn. And here we say that uh, so obviously the summation of pi i is equal to 1 to n this is going to be equal to 1 and we arrange them in an increasing order such that uh, x 1 less than x 2 less than x 3 all the way to x n. So, we have this random variables and suppose that we arrange these random variables in increasing order the reason for which will become very clear and we identify the corresponding probabilities of the random variable taking any of these increasing uh, values or this ordered values uh, x i to be equal to p i. Then what is the value at risk? Then value at risk of x this is going to be simply minus a x subscript k subscript alpha. And what is this x cross subscript k subscript alpha? So, where this k alpha is naturally going to be a natural number because it is one of those 1 through n's is the largest number such that the summation probability uh, p i's i equal to 1 to k alpha minus 1 this summation is going to be less than or equal to alpha and the reason for uh, in this definition uh, being introduced will be clear once we do the proof. So, let us start the proof for this. Now, since uh, x has a discrete distribution and uh, your x 1 is less than x 2 all the way to less than x n, we can see that 
probability that x is less than or equal to x k and since these are ordered, so obviously probability that random variable x is less than or equal to x k is going to be summation p i i is equal to 1 to k. Now, we shall also use the fact that minimum of all those case such that alpha is less than summation uh, p i i is equal to 1 to k. This will be simply the maximum of all those case such that summation p i i is equal to 1 to k minus 1 is less than or equal to alpha. Uh, so, basically uh, you can observe this very uh, easily if you actually uh, ordered uh, look at the ordered values of p 1 all the way to p of capital N and you basically set uh, the alpha to be some sort of a bifurcation criteria. So, here of course, you know alpha is pre specified. Uh, so, accordingly you identify uh, the two probabilities in between which this alpha lies. So, it is possible that alpha so, accordingly uh, you will essentially have that the sum of the probabilities uh, in one case will be less than or equal to alpha here and sum of the probabilities in the other case is going to be greater than alpha. So, essentially this means that you look at the cumulative distribution of the probabilities and then uh, you essentially identify the point where alpha is going to lie. And so, essentially alpha is going to lie between some of some case at some point you are going to switch over alpha being less than a summation of all the probabilities uh, to the situation where the alpha is going to be greater than or equal to sum of all the probabilities and that switching point is the y uh, and using that. So, essentially that means that in one case the minimum uh, the value of k uh, is uh, where alpha is less than summation of pi that is the same as the uh, this, uh, that is going to be the index for which the switching will happen and that is going to be exactly the same as the maximum of that value of k such that alpha is going to be greater than or equal to summation of all the p i's. Uh, so, once we have uh, identified this fact, uh, so therefore, we are now in a position to calculate the upper quantile which then can of course, be used to calculate what is the value at risk. So, the upper quantile by definition is the infimum of all those x such that alpha is less than probability of x less than or equal to x and this is nothing but it is the smallest. So, what are these x values? These are x k. So, it is the smallest x k such that alpha is less than probability of x less than or equal to x little k and this is minimum. of x k such that alpha is less than summation p i i is equal to 1 to k. So, uh, this comes from the definition of this probability and this minimum is not going to be nothing but maximum. So, making use of this results. So, these k's are obviously this can be replaced by x k. So, this is going to be maximum of all those x k such that summation of p i. So, this term here i equal to 1 to k minus 1 is less than or equal to alpha. And what is this? This is precisely what we had defined to be our k alpha. So, this is going to be nothing but uh, x of k alpha as defined in the statement of the result. So, we are we are done. So, therefore, uh, since the upper quantile is x k alpha. So, therefore, the value at risk is negative of upper quantile and this is minus x k alpha. All right. So, now let us make a note that so, let us now move to the continuous time setting. So, if x is a standard normal random variate uh, that is uh, 
n of x the cumulative distribution of this is 1 over square root of 2 pi into integral minus infinity to x e raised to minus z square over 2 into dz. So, then your var alpha of x if x is a standard normal random variate this is simply going to be minus n inverse of alpha and the reason is that we make use of the result that the upper quantile q alpha of x is simply going to be minus n inverse of alpha uh, is equal to minus a, a f x inverse of alpha. So, you will recall one of the results and since the cumulative distribution is the cumulative normal distribution. So, that is why I get minus n inverse of alpha and this happened if f x is continuous and strictly increasing which is the case in case of the normal distribution. Uh, so, this means that uh, if I take x to be a standard normal random variate and you recall this result for the upper quantile being uh, given by this. So, if your x is a standard normal random variate, so then the x is your n 0 1. So, essentially then this will become simply minus n inverse of alpha. So, I found out what is the var in case the random variable x is normally distributed and that is going to be minus n inverse of the pre specified value of alpha. And now we are now in a position to do our second result and we have to recall the geometric Brownian motion model. So, suppose that the price of an asset today is S0 and suppose, uh, so this is this asset is a, a stock and suppose that the price of the stock at time capital T is S of capital T. Now, you will recall that S of capital T this is given by S naught S of 0 into some e raised to m plus sigma z with z following n 0 1 distribution. Uh, so, we recall that one of the forms which this was given was S 0 is equal to S uh, T equal to S 0 into e raised to mu minus half sigma square into T plus sigma of uh, w of t. So, this is another way of writing where we take this term to be m and sigma of w t is going to be simply uh, sigma of z. Remember w t is n 0 1 n 0 t right. So, uh, this actually can be should be written as uh, this is sigma of w t and the, this can be rewritten as uh, sigma into square root of t into uh, some n 0 1 distribution. Okay. So, what is going to be the x? So, accordingly the x which is the discounted gain is e raised to minus r t into s t minus s 0. Uh, and also uh, from here you know that q alpha of z because z is n 0 1. So, from here we get q alpha of z is simply going to be equal to n inverse of alpha. Uh, so, just a slight correction here this is actually plus. So, that is how I got the. So, uh, the var was minus of this. So, please make this correction this is actually uh, plus of n inverse of alpha. So, I, I just reproduce this result here. So, we have three things now we have s of t. Uh, a formula for that using geometric Brownian motion accordingly we calculate the discounted gain and since uh, we have a z sitting here which you will need. So, accordingly we consider uh, we, uh, we just uh, uh, note that q alpha of z is equal to uh, n inverse of alpha. So, from this result. Okay. So, now observe that x is equal to f of z. So, I mean by x I mean this x where this function f say zeta 
is nothing but so e raised to minus r t and what is s t? s t is s 0 into e raised to m plus uh, sigma. So, uh, let me actually write this in detail. So, this is going to be e raised to minus r t. Uh, so, we have e raised to minus r t s t minus s 0 this is e raised to minus r t into s 0 into e raised to m plus sigma z. Uh, so, therefore, uh, I can define f of zeta which is a this is going to be e raised to minus r t s 0 e raised to so there is a minus s 0 e raised to m plus sigma zeta minus s 0. So, if I put zeta is equal to uh, z then we uh, we get back or recover this relation. Okay, now, you observe carefully. Now, this f of zeta is an increasing function right. So, therefore, what is we get? We get var alpha of x, what is this going to be? This is by definition minus q alpha of x, the up minus of upper quantile of x. What is x? x is f of z. So, this is minus q alpha f of z, but f is an increasing function. So, I can interchange this q uh, the quantile and f. So, this is equal to minus f of q alpha of z. What is q alpha of z? q alpha of z is n inverse minus alpha, uh, so n minus n inverse, uh, f inverse alpha. Uh, sorry, uh, this is uh, uh, q alpha of z is n inverse of alpha. So, just a correction. So, this is minus f of n inverse of alpha. And now, we have to evaluate the function for zeta equal to n inverse of alpha. So, this becomes minus of e raised to minus r t s 0 e raised to m plus sigma n inverse of alpha minus s 0. So, I have just replaced this zeta with n inverse of alpha and this can be written as s 0. So, we, I take the common factor of s 0 out and this becomes 1 minus e raised to. So, the s 0 is out and we combine m and r t. So, this becomes e raised to m minus r t plus we have this sigma n inverse of alpha. Uh, so, we just have a last brief result which says that let f from r to r that is a real valued function be a non decreasing right continuous function, then var alpha of f of x is going to be minus f of q alpha of x. And the proof for this is you know extremely straightforward. What is going to be start with the left hand side? So, var of f x is going to be by definition minus q alpha of f x and we just interchange the f and q. So, this becomes minus f of q alpha of x. All right. So, this brings us uh, to the end of this discussion on value at risk. So, just to do a recap, uh, we picked up from uh, the results that we had done last time on uh, the quantiles and we now introduce the definition of value at risk of x uh, to be negative of the quantile of x and we give an interpretation of the var in terms of uh, looking at the loss and the percentage level with which you can predict this loss. Uh, we looked at three different examples. The first was uh, to recognize that uh, the value at risk in case of a bond uh, since it is a risk free asset is going to be 0. And uh, then we uh, looked at uh, another example uh, in case of uh, uh, the value at risk in case of a risky asset. And finally, we looked at a very critical example of value at risk which shows that diversification does not necessarily lead to reduction in the value at risk and we identified that this observation 
uh, of the failure of diversification in achieving a lower uh, measure of risk as given by the value of uh, value at risk is something that is going to be used as a motivating reason for moving on to what is the conditional value at risk. And then we looked at a few results, uh, primarily the result uh, pertaining to determining the value at risk in case of a random variable taking the discrete values uh, and uh, uh, provided they are ordered in, in increasing fashion. And then we looked at what is going to be the value at risk in case of a random variable forming, following a standard normal random variate, which then was used to calculate the value at risk of an investment in a stock where the behavior of the stock is modeled in the continuous time framework using the geometric Brownian motion. So, this brings us to an end to the discussion on value at risk and in the next class we will conclude this topic uh, with a discussion on what is the conditional value at risk. Thank you for watching.